hear me and see me, uh, we will record this uh, segment of the town hall and hopefully as well you can see our guest, uh, Mr. Jeremy Goldcorn. So just an initial kind of um, note of instructions for people. We want to make this as interactive as possible, so please uh, type in your questions for Jeremy in the Q&A uh, chat box. Um, uh, actually, the best would, I guess, just be in the, in the chat box, and we'll go uh, with that route. Um, please feel free to type those at any point uh, during our conversation. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeremy, and then we can engage in a kind of informal conversation with him on some of these issues, but also, of course, uh, bringing in his expertise as well. So uh, Jeremy Goldcorn is editor-in-chief of SupChina.com. Um, he's also co-host with Kaiser Guo of uh, Sinica podcast. He was born in Johannesburg. He is a graduate of the University of Cape Town, um, studied literature there. He lived in China from 1995 to 2015, which is a fairly significant chunk of time. Uh, he edited magazines like Beijing Scene, Time Out, uh, Redeg, amongst others. Uh, he also founded Dan Wei, we'll talk about that, a website about Chinese media, politics, and business that ultimately was acquired by Financial Times in 2013. He moved to Nashville, Tennessee in 2015, where I think he is now. Um, he is an expert on a, a number of issues involving the media, technology, and business. So really delighted to have this opportunity to, to talk with him. And so, uh, Jeremy, just to kind of get us started, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in China? We have students that are that are listening, and it's always interesting to kind of hear the origin stories of some of the, the China experts. So why don't you tell us how you got interested in, in the China question, please? Sure. Th thanks for the introduction, Matthew. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I lived in China for 20 years, and I think every time somebody's asked me that question, I've probably given a different answer. Um, um, I, I think the strongest initial attraction was because it, in fact, was so completely foreign to me. I'd grown up in South Africa, and remember, I'm old enough to be pre-internet. Um, so by the time I graduated from university uh, in the early 1990s, the World Wide Web was, you know, in its infancy. We had no Chinese uh, departments at South African universities at that time. And South Africa was just coming out of decades of isolation because of uh, the apartheid system and the international sanctions against it. Um, and it was the 90s, which was this, you know, looking back quite extraordinary time in history, you know, between the end of the Cold War and 9-11, and essentially, we had this holiday from history. Um, but uh, China seemed to me big and important uh, but it was uh, so difficult to understand. I mean, I didn't, you know, understand the the language. The writing was completely foreign. The food was foreign, um, and it just seemed like somewhere I could really get as far away as possible from South Africa, which I think perhaps was the strongest motivation at the time. Thank you. I I, I want to uh, stay on the the question of South Africa, um, if I may. So. We've heard uh, quite a bit from Fareed Zakaria about the US-China relationship, and obviously that is a bilateral relationship that's of interest and focus to, to many of us, given the, the, the importance in terms of economics, uh, uh, you know, trade investment, climate cooperation, military concerns, and so on. Um, but I think it's also important to, to learn about China from other perspectives, um, to learn about China from people that are situated outside of this particular bilateral relationship. So, Maybe this is an unfair question for you, but uh, you know, how do South Africans think about China? Are there a kind of spectrum of views that you could identify, um, and and how have those views uh, changed over over time, over the time that you've been focused on on China? Well, with the caveat that I haven't been back to South Africa in a few years, and I haven't lived there um, in more than a quarter of a century. Um, I would say that uh, government to government relations are very different between the South African government and China. Uh, the South African government doesn't want to see China as an enemy. There, there is no sort of ideological reason for that. And they really like the fact that there's another source of support and money uh, aside from uh, Western Europe uh, and the United States. Um, and they actively encourage you know, all kinds of exchanges and trade. 
and that the Chinese Communist Party has in fact cultivated party to party relations with the African National Congress, our ruling party, quite carefully. They've you know, put a lot of money into actually building the ANC, a, a party school. Um, and, you know, they have, uh, you know, very, you know, the ANC was started in, in the early 20th century. Um, you know, they're, they're both uh, left wing parties with a very long history of socialist thinking. So there's a lot of affinities between the ruling parties. Um, and I think the South African government would envies, of course, the economic boom of China, but they, I think they also envy the ability to control society that the Chinese government has. Um, so, you know, on an elite level and, and, you know, the business, there's huge ties. One interesting fact very few people know is that Tencent, one of the enormous Chinese internet companies, you know, the Google plus Microsoft of, of China, if you will, um, is roughly 30% owned by a South African company called NASPERS, which um, in fact is sort of the remnants of, if South Africa, the apartheid South Africa had had a, a Xinhua news agency, had like a state propaganda news agency, NASPERS would have been it. And it transformed itself into a private company, was in China very early and made one really, really smart investment. That most of the value of the company NASPERS is now in fact in their holding in Tencent. So, you know, business elites, political elite, very close relationship. In the media, the conversation you tend to see is uh, much more driven by like American and British Anglophone media. So you're, you're seeing a lot more questioning and hostility towards China and suspicion of it. Um, and then, you know, on a street level, we have a problem with xenophobia in, in, in South Africa and migrants from other African countries being targeted and, you know, looting and stuff like that. And Chinese people have been exposed to similar effects. So it's a very big range of different views of China, ranging from, you know, the very uh, people and, you know, who love China to people who are very suspicious of China. Okay, fascinating to hear about the minority South African uh, shares in Tencent. I had no idea. Uh, that's utterly fascinating. I want to talk a little bit more about the, the tech companies and, and what's what's happening there. But before we go into that topic, it'd be helpful to, to understand a bit more about how you got interested in this space in, in Beijing in terms of thinking about the media and news and how you kind of approach this, this field or this industry, right? Like, how did you situate yourself? What did that look like? And then how did you kind of um, learn about this industry ultimately uh, uh, leading you to, to founding Danway? Then we'll, we'll talk about that. Sure, well, uh, the first, I, 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 the, I got to China with a, an English teaching job at a big company that was trying to teach its employee, an engineer, Swiss engineering company, nothing to do with media. Uh, but my second job in China was as managing editor of Beijing Scene, that I think you mentioned, which was, it was a timeout type of publication uh, uh, aimed at expatriates in English about, uh, you know, where to eat and drink and have fun in Beijing. Um, and this was started at a time when, uh, you know, the, the community of foreign foreigners, di diplomats, but especially business people was growing very fast. Uh, you know, uh, mid to late 90s in Beijing. And there were more and more restaurants and bars, um, but there was no nowhere to find out where they were. And this is a long time before Yelp and mobile phones and the internet, you know, most uh, expatriates, foreigners living in China in 1996 did not in fact have internet. Uh, you know, they may have had an email connection, uh, but very few had World Wide Web. So, you know, there wasn't, uh, so print was actually still a thing, <laughs> which, um, you know, it seems amazing now. But um, so th this magazine was started by an American and it was it was a bit like an American alt weekly, if any of you are familiar with it. You know, there was a sort of a, a it had a bit of attitude and a sort of political attitude and kind of sarcastic tone about it. Um, and we were trying to navigate doing it. And it wasn't really possible to do it legally because uh, to, to run a, a print magazine, a print publication in China, you needed what was called a, a kahao, a publication license. And the only uh, organizations that had them were uh, state-owned publishers or some big state-owned uh, enterprises. So, you know, the old fashioned Dunway, you know, work unit, like a big one, you know, say it was an engineering company making widgets, they would also have their own hospital and you know probably their own schools for for the children of the workers um and they would have their own newspaper and the newspaper would sort of replicate whatever was going on in you know uh, in beijing 
uh, but it would be their own thing. So all of these kind of uh, work units had a kanaha or a publication license. So the only way we could publish legally was to team up with one of these and essentially rent the publication license. Now, this is basically the same business model that internet companies use to get foreign capital and you know, operate legally in China. The entity that actually has the licenses uh, to run the business, like the media business or the internet business, might not actually be the entity that's actually running it. So we were doing this with a print magazine and we had a lot of problems because you know, one of our rivals reported us for being illegal and we were shut down and we had troubles with the partners and we changed partners several times. And so, you know, the partners would try and take over the business once they thought they knew what was going on. So it, it was a crazy time when you could kind of just, um, I mean, Beijing felt a little like the Wild West, you know. Uh, the central government wasn't too concerned. As long as you didn't piss off anyone too much locally, you'd probably be okay. But like we kept on pissing off people locally and getting closed down. But it was, I mean, it was incredible fun as a young man for one thing. But then there was this also really interesting sort of game of cat and mouse with the regulators uh, to do with, you know, how, how to actually get a, a license and publish legally. So then after that, I got involved in other, uh, other media, you know, print and internet media, um, you know, working for other companies. So I, I sort of worked in the business and got to know a bunch of people. And, uh, you know, for, for several years, I was quite hopeful that China's media business might actually, you know, really open up. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> a naive young man I was. Right. And, and so you've had these, uh, very early on, you had these interactions with, with the regulators and you kind of learned how to, um, work within this system, which at the time seems like, as, as you put it, it was kind of the, the Wild West and there was a certain freedom or mobility or liquidity within that system, right? It's sort of like if you kind of understood the rules and how they worked, or if you knew the key people, then you could kind of get things done, right? And so maybe it was a matter of, again, sort of knowing the right people, but also having the resources to, to you know, open the right doors and so on and so forth. How, how do you contrast that kind of environment for doing business with what we see now? And how do you explain that, that transition that has happened over the last you know, 15 years or so? Well, I, I think, yeah, it's very different. Uh, you know, the media is perhaps where it's most noticeable, but I mean, you know, this would uh, be across the board like any kind of business really. Um, you know, in the 1990s, uh, you know, the tentative reforms in the 80s were sort of stalled there was a big hiccup with 1989, uh, you know, both within China, but also foreign, you know, capital's attitude to what was going on in China. So everything slowed down a bit, but it was getting going again in the 1990s. And the government's attitude was that they wanted to open up the economy. You know, I think it was always pretty clear that there was never a determination by anyone in the government to open up politically. I think that avenue had been closed off in 1989, but there was certainly a determination to open up economically and to develop the country. But nobody knew exactly what the right way to do it was. And I think one of the things that, you know, I mean, Deng Xiaoping gets the credit and some revisionists would prefer to assign other people the credit. Even some people, you know, talk about uh, Xi Jinping's daddy, uh, Xi Jinping, as, as being one of the key people. But fr from the very beginning of the reform and opening up, there was this willingness to experiment locally. And if something worked, you know, the central government would say, okay, let's, you know, roll that out in other, other places. And it, it did in involve a certain amount of open-mindedness, you know, and that I think covered, um, you know, everything from, you know, the media business to, uh, you know, widgets. Um, uh, that's no longer the case. I think the Chinese government has a much better idea of how they'd like things to work um, and how they would like things not to work. And there's also not the kind of learning curve that was there at the beginning of the 90s. I mean, the thing was, one of the fun things about sort of being an entrepreneur in, in Beijing or just a curious young person really was that, um, you know, everything was new. So like five-star hotels were opening up and nobody knew how to make a cocktail. So like I knew people who weren't like special mixologists or whatever you call them back home, but they knew what a martini should taste like. So they, you know, 
got on the early internet and figured out the good 10 cocktail recipes and then suddenly became a famous mixologist, you know, in Shanghai or whatever. I mean, you know, ranging from that to like what I was doing in the media business, everybody was kind of making it up as they, as they went along, which was a lot of fun and very exciting. Uh, but now, the, you know, there's no need for that. Everybody in Shanghai knows what a martini tastes like and they know it better than any foreigner can tell them. Uh, and uh, the government knows very well what a martini can taste like, and they don't want you doing making certain kinds of martinis, and that's just it. So, <laughs> so, so, but is there something um, more to be said about sort of this this current sort of um, movement that we're there, we're seeing in terms of what's been called a kind of crackdown ac across the board, right? About you know, in terms of tech, in terms of luxury brands, in terms of entertainment. I mean. Do you see that as as kind of a, a governmental effort to sort of shift culture a certain way? Um, do you still see sort of undercurrents of of, of mobility and, and freedom to operate within that system, or have those avenues kind of shut down as as well? I mean, fundamentally, what what really is driving this this crackdown, and and where do you see it going? Yeah. I that's uh, you know something that I'm thinking about every day, and we're, we're like sub China. We're, we're working on on this type of thing. I think you know China is a big and now rich country with a very diverse population and economy. So there's always room for a hustler to hustle, and you know we're working on a story about uh, DeFi at the moment, which is you know a blockchain based business that is connected to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, but is really a a new kind of thing. And there's this tremendous entrepreneurial excitement around it in China. And everybody's saying, yeah, the government really can't control this one, even though Bitcoin has just been, you know, in some ways completely, well, it hasn't really, but it's sort of been neutered in China, or at least you can't build a business around it uh, that involves trading it. Um, and yet there are these, you know, plenty of, you know, some of the smartest people in the world, you know, staying awake all night coding their new DeFi apps and they're, you know, they see opportunity. So I would say there, you know, there, there does of course remain, and I, you know, I, I don't know the background of the, the audience, but whether you're, a, you're a, a scholar or in business, I mean, I think that kind of energy, you see it in, you know, all fields of human endeavor. It's not just business, although business is maybe the easiest in some ways. Um, so that hasn't changed, but the, the government has decided that the uh, reform and opening up period has delivered its goods um, and that a new period is needs to happen. And I think some of this is connected with Xi Jinping's personal ambitions, and he wants to be the person who ushers in a new era. And in order for there to be a new era, you've got to kind of kill off the old era. And I think some of that what's going on is that. Um, I think there is genuine concern at the extreme inequality in the country and the, the sort of fragile nature of the development. I mean, what Wen Jiabao, you know, many years ago identified as the four uns, you know, unstable, um, unbalanced, I can't remember the other two uns. And uh, also, I think was it 2011, just before Xi Jinping, uh, you know, first came into office as, as, you know, party secretary and president, there was this Deng Yuen, the scholar, previous editor of the party, Communist Party's journal, I think. And he, he wrote about the, uh, the 10 great problems left behind by the Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao administration. And these were, I mean, most of these problems are connected with social inequality with unbalanced growth, you know, environmental degradation, uh, with society having no uh, faith in anything, um, people, you know, not having anything to believe in. Uh, and so there is a genuine attempt to try and remedy all of these. Um, so, I mean, I think these are, are, are two of, of the big factors uh, driving it. Um, I think there's also the sense that, uh, things were getting out of control um, and uh, in pr private capital, uh, uh, non-party intellectuals, civil society was becoming too powerful for the party's comfort and particularly, you know, an authoritarian leader like Xi Jinping uh, saw that as, uh, uh, you know, something that could create problems for the party and they do definitely want to hang on to power. So a bunch of things going on. 
Absolutely. So you've done an amazing job sort of tracking these different uh, trends and, and developments. I want to kind of return to your story in terms of how you were able to do what uh, you did during these different time periods, right? So we have the, the mid to late 90s, kind of this period of the Wild West, this kind of hustle um, era. And then, and then we have now where it's a very different kind of regulatory environment and business environment for doing this type of work. Uh, public facing work in China. So tell us about the, the project um, Don Wei and sort of how that came about. You know, you, you described you did have this experience working for a number of different um, uh, magazines. Tell us about how uh, Don Wei came about and sort of what you were trying to accomplish with that project. And then maybe kind of contrast that or, or relate that to what you're doing now with, with SubChina. I'm curious about if there's kind of an arc there in terms of the, the projects that you worked on. Sure. So Dunway, I started in 2003, and uh, it was almost just because the technology was right. Um, you know, it was still fairly early days for the, the internet, the World Wide Web. Um, and uh, in, in, from about, you know, the very late 90s it started, but, you know, 2002, it became mainstream, was blogging, blogging software. And... Um, it sounds so sort of passe now, even the, the, the word blog is sort of unfashionable, but I mean, all, all a blog really was, was a very easy and cheap way for somebody to launch a website. Uh, it made it kind of idiot proof to, to be a website publisher. You needed, you know, no technical knowledge, essentially, just, you know, half an hour of patience and fiddling about with, uh, the settings. And that was the catalyst. I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, you know, I can be a publisher with a budget of zero. And having been, you know, in the media business, mostly print where, you know, just printing is, I mean, you've got to have money to print stuff, right? I mean, it, <laughs> it's serious. And, uh, you know, obviously in China, you know, all the complications of the publication license and everything, whereas the internet was free. And at that time, you know, most of the global internet was not yet blocked by the Chinese government, you know, so uh, it was still, uh, it was, I mean, the Great Firewall was already there, but, um, you know, social media, I mean, blogs, I guess, were the infancy of social media, and that wasn't blocked, uh, and many of, you know, Wikipedia wasn't blocked, um, so the technology was right, and I also, ha having been wor working uh, in, in, in mostly in Beijing in the media business, I realized how sort of exciting China seemed at the time. 2003 was the year when the Southern Metropolis Daily, this you know, now kind of famous or notorious newspaper in Guangzhou did an investigative story about this migrant uh, in Guangzhou who, got, who died in police custody. And this story, you know, was, uh, circulated on the internet and it basically led to changes uh, in the way the Guangzhou police handled migrants and you know some sort of uh, actual the, the government responded to uh, a media article and an internet uh, reaction to it uh, and there were a lot of Chinese publishers and uh, you know early kind of bloggers essentially who were just getting going around that time so there was this sort of creative and entrepreneurial and sort of political foment going on. And it was fun and exciting. Um, and nobody was really reporting on it. Um, the big Western media companies, uh, many of them still were sort of very old fashioned in the way they approached China. They had much smaller bureaus than they all do now. I mean, now most of the major media, well, you know, the New York Times, et cetera, they've all been kicked out, but they used to have very, until recently, very big bureaus. But that only happened in the run up to the Olympics, you know, 2003, 2004. 2005, those uh, were not uh, really a thing yet. So the, the reporting on China in English tended to be only the big political news. And it, it felt kind of out of touch with what was going on, you know, on the ground in China. So that was the, the, the sort of fun part was reporting on that. And that's where I, that's why I saw a sort of a, uh, an, on, you know, a, a, an entrepreneurial opportunity, but also an opportunity to do something that actually felt like it was um, of, of significance because I was putting stuff in English that otherwise wouldn't have existed. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Can I just kind of interject there? So di did you kind of then um, see yourself as, as, as a kind of investigative journalist in that capacity? So like you mentioned the Sundar Gang case, um, 
that I think was the re-education re through labor case, right? That you know, once that hit and, and the media kind of really seized on that. And it, it, like you said, it generated this kind of uh, moment of reflection on you know, what, what the current laws and regulations were and potentially how they could be changed. And there was a sort of like burst of, of, of kind of um, you know, grassroots sort of interest in these issues that you know, the tongue biaos of the world kind of became more interested in, 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 in thinking about media as a mechanism for promoting you know, legal and, and social change. And were you also thinking in terms of kind of as, you know, in your capacity as a foreigner, of course, but being part of this sort of broader, you know, uh, uh, moment of where journalism uh, and particularly sort of investigative journalism could potentially push some kind of social change? Was that how you were thinking or was it something totally different? I personally wasn't trying to be an investigative journalism journalist, but there was there was so much good stuff being produced by Chinese journalists and bloggers, and if not good, at least you know information that just in the past had never existed in the public sphere. That I thought that finding the good stuff, finding the good information that Chinese people were making, was the main uh, purpose of what I was doing. Uh, I, like my ambitions, I thought, you know, if I could make it into like a big business, sure, yeah, eventually I'll have my own cable TV station and we'll definitely do hard hitting investigative journalism. But my ambitions were relatively modest in the sense that I thought the, the main opportunity for me as like just some dude in Beijing, some foreigner with like no capital essentially, was to basically find a way to showcase and translate what was going on in, in, in China. You know, it grew to incorporate different things. I mean, I, we, I was very early on uh, video on YouTube, you know, making little short documentaries, which are still on YouTube, uh, Downway TV. Uh, and uh, uh, they, um, you know, so I was always looking for ways to sort of extend it. And definitely investigative journalism would have been something, you know, if I'd ever been able to get, get it big enough uh, doing what it did. Uh, but that wasn't the immediate end. Sure. So let, let's hear a little bit more about Don Wei and how it worked and, and sort of what what the um, kind of day-to-day -day operations were. So were you kind of just um, pouring through the, the, the Chinese microblogs? Was that kind of one uh, sort of activity that you're doing? Did you have, I mean, a staff, like what kind of, what size of a staff were we talking about? Were you doing the translation work? Were you working with um, native Chinese speakers? Describe a little bit about how, you know, the operation. Sure. So look, when it started, there were no microblogs. This was before microblogs. So, okay. there, and there weren't really blogs in Chinese yet. There were, but there were a lot of forums and there, there were a very small number of blogs. There were internet forums and then there were media companies that posted usually the same articles that everybody copied online, but some of them had comment sections that were interesting. So, you know, that was the user generated content. And then there were, you know, uh, publications like, uh, you know, uh, before Caixin, there was Taijing, uh, there was the Southern uh, group uh, that were kind of uh, traditional newspapers or news organizations, but that were doing interesting stuff online. So that, that was all the source material. Initially, it was just me, like what today you'd call doom scrolling all night long, like hating my, at that time, like the early days I was um, running a little design and advertising agency with some friends and hating the job we worked, we were doing for clients. So all night doom scrolling finding interesting things and then just kind of, I mean, you know, fairly casually, it was very bloggy. So it was just like, here's an interesting thing and I would translate one paragraph. Um, after about a year of doing that, I, I, I met up with a guy named Joel Martinson, who is a literary translator now, but he, he was living in Northeastern China. Um, and uh, he started doing the same thing, although much better than me. And then by about 2006, I basically turned it into a company and then I grew it to eventually we had a staff of like editorial about five of us um, and a mix of Chinese and foreigners uh, and yeah uh, we made videos uh, which was one thing we did originally I commissioned a fair amount of tour in the later few years of original journalism uh, and we did a lot of sort of translating and commenting on goings on Chinese language stuff and, and yeah, it's amazing. And I'm sure your Chinese accelerated rapidly as a, as a result of all, all the, the Chinese that you, were, that you were reading. Was your audience exclusively 
foreigners though, or were Chinese also picking up on what you were doing and that have any positive knock-on effects that you saw at all in terms of collaborations or what have you? Yeah, Chinese were actually. I, I mean, I, I um, the thing was some Chinese people found it quite interesting as a way to um, uh, like get a quick catch up on like what was going on on the Chinese internet without them having to sort through it themselves. Uh, even though I was a foreigner and it was in English, but it was, you know, people who read a bit of English, it was kind of convenient. And then uh, I got very involved in the Chinese blogging community as it emerged. So there was uh, an annual Chinese bloggers conference from 2004 to 2009 was the last year it operated. And I'd go every year and, you know, then the whole company done way, we'd, we'd all go the whole, you know, bunch of us towards the end of it. Uh, and we did things with the Chinese blogging community that, you know, translated stuff, uh, try to sort of be a part of that uh, emerging sort of internet media landscape. But sadly, we all got crushed. You know, the, 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 it started before Xi Jinping. I mean, you know, it was really 2009 was Dunway was blocked, but also it was the last year of the Chinese bloggers conference. 2009, you know, the Olympics were over, the global financial crisis had happened. Uh, and the attitude in China shifted about, about the internet, the government's attitude. Uh, and gradually, uh, you know, that, that, that old community was sort of destroyed. So you, you talk about this, this period, this kind of end period. What, what did that then push you to do? And, and then if you can describe sort of from that period then to the establishment of sub-China and, and how sub-China is sort of engaging with China potentially in a, a very different China than Don Wei did, right? In terms of where it was in, in terms of, you know, media and potential freedom of expression and, and regulation and, and so on. So if you can walk us through that kind of post Don Wei period to sub-China, that'd be great. Sure. So, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, you know, some of this personally obviously had to do with me uh, leaving China and coming to the United States. Uh, it also, you know, being kind of impossible to do what Dunway was doing. It also had to do with the fact I sold the company and the, the uh, you know, something I haven't mentioned, but the, the profit making arm of Dunway was pretty much always uh, research work that we were doing for companies. Um, and uh, you know, that became sort of uh, the main aim of the business and it got subsumed. Uh, I sold it to the Financial Times and just afterwards, uh, the former owner of the Financial Times sold it to uh, Nikkei, the Japanese group. And there were a number of research businesses in, in the company. So I, you know, Dunway's people were subsumed into that group. Um, and, uh, I didn't, you know, I worked out my contract, but I, I didn't really want to run a research company. And um, so I, uh, uh, you know, when my contract was up, I, I joined SubChina, which was just getting going. Um, and this is uh, in a New York based company founded by a woman named Ang Ah Chang, who has a background from the, the financial industry. Um, and her idea to found, uh, found it was that she just wanted someone to send her an email every day telling her like the top five news items about China. So she decided, formed a company to try and make that email and then, you know, ended up getting a bit more ambitious. So now, you know, we're a media company, we operate events. We are trying to report on China in English with the kind of focus of, uh, you know, people who are really, you know, specialized in it rather than uh, a generalist American or European news organization. Um, but to do it, you know, uh, objectively and critically, uh, which is pretty tough. Everybody feels very strongly about China these days. So uh, I, not a day goes by where somebody doesn't accuse me of doing something, either being too supportive of the Communist Party or, you know, being anti-Chinese or something. So, uh, but on the other hand, it's also quite um, interesting because it, ma it feels like it matters now. <laughs> so I, th this is uh, really interesting to, to hear you because, you know, one of the issues I think where we are now in terms of um, the role that new media and Twitter, et cetera, plays in our everyday lives is we're kind of inundated with all this news, right? So in some sense, there's a overabundance of 
of news. But do you feel that that's the case when it comes to China? As you know, over the last recent years, the foreign journalists have been pushed out. Um, that space seems to be closing. Um, how, how are you guys now kind of accessing those really critical stories and sort of the, the in, some, in some ways, potentially the fringe stories, the stories that otherwise you wouldn't hear about in, in China? And, and what does it look like in terms of contributing to maybe a narrowing stream of information about China? Um. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough. I mean, we have two people in China, so uh, that's good. We do still do a lot of stuff based on the internet. You know, uh, um, uh, one of our editors, Jiayun, writes almost daily on usually internet-based social issues. And th there is still a lot of interesting things going on on the internet. You know, the, the, the politics are, like in 2006 and seven, you had, you know, writers like Han Han kind of actually talking about democracy and people actually arguing about it on the Chinese internet. And those days are, are long gone. But right now you have some fascinating debates about, you know, say feminism, uh, about, uh, you know, even the government policies on uh, trying to encourage women to have, birth, you know, to, to have more babies. You know, you, there there is still plenty of critical stuff. So, um, you know, it's not like we're completely out of touch, but uh, yeah, it's difficult to report on the ground in China. We have to be a little careful with people we have there. We're, it's difficult to get everything on the internet. And uh, it's not just us, you know, all the major American media organizations pretty much have got this problem now. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, one, one of the um, members of the National Committee of China Relations, Professor Ben Lehman at, at Columbia Law School, has made the comment in a, in a conference, in a public conference, that it seems like in many ways, from the academic side of things, that China doesn't want to be studied anymore, right? So I'm curious to hear, like, from your viewpoint as somebody who studies sort of knowledge production at, at from a different vantage that is news and media, you know, what it, what it means for you and, and for your colleagues and the people that you work with in terms of this moment of kind of enclosure, right? Of digital enclosure, of, of sort of regulatory enclosure. I mean, how do you grapple with that? And, and you know, are you optimistic? Um, I'm not terribly optimistic. Uh, I have to say in terms of access, you know, I, I mean, if I can just respond like to the, the idea of China doesn't want to be studied anymore. Uh, I, I mean, China wants to be studied only in certain kinds of ways. And if you're prepared to study in those kinds of ways, uh, I think there's still plenty of room for you. And this relates, I see somebody asked in the chat about self-censorship. I, I think this is kind of related. I, I think one of the big difficulties of, of dealing with China right now is in fact that certain things that you want to do in China are going to uh, necessitate self-censorship or a certain worldview. I mean, it's not even just an academia. The, the Wire China just published a profile on, on the, the hedge fund billionaire Ray Dalio, who uh, is you know, famously you know, very bullish and positive on China and um, you know, there's this whole interview where he claims, like, I really know China really well because I've been going there since the 80s and I know Wang Tishan, you know, this kind of thing. And the interviewer asks him about human rights and he says, well, I don't really know about those issues. You know, I mean, you know, so it's not just academics. I mean, you know, hedge fund billionaires also, if you want to deal with China and go there and do certain things in China, well, those are the rules you're going to have to obey. And for some people, the, the, that's kind of difficult. I mean, I, I, the reason I don't live in China anymore, there are a few of them, but one of them is I can't deal with that anymore. Like, if they don't let me back in, then they don't let me back in. But I, I like, I'm not going to worry that they're going to come in the night and take my babies or something, and, and therefore have to um, restrict my speech, which, you know, is very unlikely to most people, scholars in China, you know, this isn't going to happen. But that's kind of the the base threat at some level that people are dealing with. There's some fear of something nasty happening of, you know, the two Canadians, uh, I guess, or, or the, you know, the two Michaels, uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor comes to everybody's mind who's, who's a scholar, you know, or an academic or even a student in the field. And I think those fears are completely reasonable, you know, 
And of course, I have plenty of friends in China who say, oh, don't be silly. You know, I'm just living my life and it's great. And I just got back from happy hour. And, you know, isn't this a lovely electric car, Didi, that I got in with my WeChat app and we QR scanned and nobody's got COVID and how wonderful it is here. But yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you for, for that answer. And I'm glad that you referenced the questions in, in the chat. I wanted to get into those a little bit. And I wanted to uh, kind of ask you a bit more about this question, because again, we you know, have students um, in, in attendance and there are young people who are thinking about China as a career. So what advice do you have for somebody who's just kind of starting their career? And as you said, you have to kind of learn the rules if you want to be there and situated and in, in doing your work, um, the person who asked the question sees a kind of trade-off here. They're, what they're asking is, how do you balance what they call the macro level need for our next generation of leaders to understand China with a more immediate need to speak out on issues concerning that, that you might be concerned about? Um, in, in particular, thinking about your own personal safety. So if you were just starting out right at this point um, in your career, what, what would you, how would you approach this kind of minefield of, of issues? I, I very with a great deal of caution, you know, with a great deal of caution, because uh, it's also very different from when I was starting out. There was no internet. Like I could talk shit at a bar, and it did, you know, that that's it. It's gone. Nobody remembers, you know. Whereas now, you know, people sort of grow up on social media, and 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 your opinions, uh, are, you know, they become part of the, the the ether, you know, part of the permanent record. So I mean, I would say if you're serious about a career that involves China, be very thoughtful and deliberate about you, you know, how you communicate about China. And that doesn't mean self-censor, but understand that if this is what you want to do, just think through the consequences and maybe you don't want to do this if that feels too onerous, you know, to think through that. Um, uh, you know, uh, as I said, like, I'm not prepared to self-censor and it's a reason I don't live in China anymore. And, you know, hopefully they'll let me back, but I don't know, maybe I'll be too scared to apply for a visa next time. I, that's okay, I, I, I've made my peace, but I did live there for 20 years. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do feel that I, I, I had uh, enough time in there that I, I'm not gonna regret it if they don't let me back. So that puts me in a different position from somebody starting out their career completely. So, I, I mean, I would just, yeah, encourage people to be thoughtful about it. But I, I think that if, if, if there's a, uh, you know, when thinking about how to develop a career, there's also, I see a question about careers, if I could redo anything. Maybe this is not about me redoing anything, but I, I would say, be careful of a career path that focuses on a certain type of access to China. You know, if you have to be in China to do something, th then, you know, understand that that could be very frustrating if you're not allowed to be there, you know. And uh, uh, if uh, being diplomatic is not your strong suite, uh, you know, there are certain careers that are China related that you probably don't want to consider. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Well said. Now, that's very helpful, uh, particularly, again, for, for those that are thinking about just, just starting out. And, and there was also another question um, in, in the chat box in terms of um, your biggest frustration in terms of commentary on China. So you, you're, you're dealing with you know, this, this very uh, vociferous and multifaceted um, uh, industry of, of you know, the news on China and there's strong views and, and there's people that have decades of experience like you do and know the language, have been in country. Then there are people that, you know, don't have that, right, that are still kind of out there and they're, they're pounding on, on their Twitter account or what have you. Um, how, how, how do you kind of approach those different voices and, and how do you make sense of them and, and what are some of the frustrations that you have? Yeah. Um, give me a minute to think about it. I'm going to just complete answering, would I redo anything in my career? Uh, because uh, I, I would. I think the answer to that is that I would um, get more involved with another country that was related, like Korea or Japan or a Southeast Asian country. Uh, both because I think I, as you know, my there's a big gap in my sort of China education, which is a, a knowledge of the context, geographic and cultural. But also because I think that when China gets very frustrating, there would be another place to sort of 
put some of my energies and it's not all about, you know, if you're in Britain and British or American or, you know, Indian and you're studying China and only China, then it's always between your country and China. Whereas if you also have some of your scholarship and your energies in another geographical location, it might, I think that would have been good for me. I don't know if that applies to anybody else. So now the frustrations with the commentary on China, uh, now that I've, I, I've thought about it, I, I think, um, you know, some of it is just uh, uh, frustrations with our hyper-connected modernity. Um, like uh, when I was much younger, one of my favorite writers was Milan Kundera and he used to write, he had this concept about graphomania, about how everybody wants to be a writer and actually it's complete hell when, when everybody is writing all the time because all you've got is this constant babble. And this, he wrote this before social media, you know. So, I mean, I, I think in some ways the frustration is just that everybody's got an opinion and China is now, whereas when I first went there, like when I, you know, leave China, it was difficult to get anyone to care that nobody, people didn't even really know where it was sort of, you know, and nobody cared. Whereas now everybody has an opinion on it. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, 90% of that is just complete trash. Uh, that is probably the most frustrating thing. I think in the United States, uh, that's compounded by the fact that it's become this, it's the only thing that it, there is any bipartisan consensus on in the US is the need to be tough on China. Um, and so it, it, it brings out like the worst of sort of the American sort of political character of, you know, just no detail, you know, all big stick, big kind of baseball bat kind of macho swinging, you know, we've got to get tough on Beijing. And so, so much of what's going on here is based on this not very sophisticated reaction to quite a complex challenge. And, you know, um, America being America, that message, it, it, get, it, it permeates the world. You know, you, it's very influential in, in, in Britain. It, it dominates the way South Africans think about China. Uh, you know, it goes to New Zealand even. <laughs> Yeah, on, on this point of sort of perceptions about China, particularly as you're situated in the US now, I mean, on the one hand, the US-China relationship is so phenomenally central to so many things in the world today, right? So there's that very central uh, importance. But then on the other hand, you know, um, in US universities now, we see a decline in, in students that are taking China-related courses. We see less interest now in studying Chinese language and so on and so forth. So it seems to be, on the other hand, this other trend where there's this apathy or, or now kind of lack of interest. So how do you, I mean, where, where is that coming from and, and how do you make sense of that? Yeah, that's true. I know it is sort of contradictory, isn't it? Uh, um, it, it it's, um, I, I suppose it it's like, it doesn't seem cool anymore. Uh, there was a, a period of time when it, it had a certain uh, appeal. It was the hot new thing and that that's worn off. Um, I mean, I, I think it's part of the same problem of this, this sort of uh, extremely unsophisticated reaction to the challenge of China that you see in the United States is also, you know, the fact that actually, uh, despite the fact that everybody agrees it's America's biggest challenge or at least one of them, nobody actually wants to study it in any detail. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and there, there's less incentive for it. And, you know, um, the Confucius Institutes are gradually shutting down in the United States. And while, I mean, I personally don't think that's a bad thing. I always thought they were pretty dodgy you know, in one way or another. I mean, I don't know, you know, there, there's lots of reasons. I have many friends have worked for them. Uh, you know, many of them have, you know, people have learned Chinese and that's great. But I mean, there was always something a little sketchy about that kind of partnership with a Chinese government controlled organization and that those kind of partnerships are just gonna get more and more difficult. But sadly, I don't think the disappearing ones are going to get replaced by a sensible alternative. You know, those opportunities to learn Chinese and uh, you know, learn the language at the very least uh, are going to just disappear. Yeah, that's something that people don't think about. I mean, people on the on both the right and the left may be against Confucius Institutes and they want to shut them down, um, uh, but they don't think about sort of what what happens next, right? So that's I think where you're going to, and that's a really critical question. So on that on that question, I wanted to ask you, 
what what how do you want sub china to sort of contribute to this current moment in the us china relationship but but also more broadly sort of how china is regarded in in the world i mean what is your and your colleagues vision for how you can contribute to shaping um public perception of, of what's happening in china yeah that, i mean that's a tough one because I, I i don't want to um you know do pr for nice china us relations uh even though I think sometimes people suspect we're that way. And, you know, I mean, some of my colleagues and the people who uh, write for us certainly, you know, are very invested in good US-China relations. Um, and uh, we have people, you know, who are, let's say, somewhat more hostile than that too. Um, so I, I think for me personally, I'd like us to be able to inform about China that, uh, you know, maybe it won't happen just in one article or one video, but if you uh, follow us, uh, you will be informed about China in a way that will enable you to make up your mind about what's going on without resorting to stereotypes. Um, and I hope that we can fill in the gaps between you know, um, Jamil Andalini, who used to be the FT bureau chief in Beijing and various other, uh, uh, you know, roles in, in, in China, uh, he once said to me that there's three China stories. There's, there's big China, there's bad China or scary China, and then there's weird China. And to a certain extent, that is still true if you look in the media. So big China is, you know, 1.4 billion people, so many million billion babies, you know, X amount of dollars and remember so many Bitcoins, so many sheep, you know, if all the sheep in China fall, it'll like blah, 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 you know, whatever. You can make a great statistic out of China anytime you want. You know, bad and scary China, they've got a hypersonic missile, they're locking up Uyghurs, you know, there's always a scary China and, you know, legitimately there's many things about China that are very scary. And then there's weird China, which is, you know, uh, peasant farmers who make robots or, you know, the world's biggest sex doll factory or whatever. And those to this day are still the main China stories that the West pays attention to. And if that's all you ever look at, you're gonna have a very like malformed idea of what China is. So my hope is that we can fill in some of the missing bits in the middle. That's brilliant. Um, so, Jeremy, we're about at the end of our of our time. And unless there's any last question, I want to uh, leave an opportunity for anybody else to quick uh, chime in with a with a question. While we have Jeremy, now would be your chance. If not, I think we should just kind of close on that. That was an, a, a tremendous uh, presentation in terms of uh, your wealth of experience and your uh, perspective on China, working in China and now working outside uh, of China, but nonetheless very, very much enmeshed in, in what's going on there. Um, it's been really, really enlightening. So I wanna thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, for joining us. And, and thank you, uh, those of you in attendance for sticking with us. Um, Please uh, take a look at the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations website for future events. And so we will kind of virtually uh, applaud Jeremy. Thank you again very much for uh, sharing Thank your you. experience perspective with us. And we'll end there. Uh, so, Jeremy, I'll ask you to stay on just a few more minutes, uh, but we'll ask the other people to, uh, to now uh, please take their leave. So, again, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. So I see that um, Todd Hall is is uh, still in attendance. I'm I'm trying to think the best way of sort of bringing him in. Let me see if I can. Now I'm going to allow him to come in here. Okay, I got it. So uh, Todd Hall is the director of the China Center, and I just want to have the opportunity for you guys to. Are you still yeah. recording? Uh, yeah. Let me uh, one second. Let me stop that.